Well, thank you. Thank you, ladies. Hello, hello. And for the ladies listening in Spanish, hola, hola. Las quiero mucho. Um, so, <laughs> at first, I was going to thank you all for giving me what I thought would be the easiest chapter in Hebrews. <laughs> But then I realized as I was studying it that Hebrews 13 covers this like really wide range of totally unrelated topics that have whole books written about each of them. So thank you anyway, because I learned a lot more than I was expecting. <laughs> And this year in Hebrews, we've seen not only that Jesus is better, we've sure heard that all year, right? Jesus is better. But like Dr. Chow says, because Jesus is better, Jesus is worthy of our living. I'm sorry, I'm such a mess. Every time I cry about something, Jesus is worthy of our living and our dying, which means, like other men have explained, Jesus is worthy of our loyalty of our perseverance. Okay, in life and death. Jesus is worthy of our perseverance, our loyalty. And here at the end of the book, the preacher who is so pastoral, right? He finishes up his sermon, his word of exhortation, like he calls it in verse 22, to help the Hebrews, to help us, stay loyal to Jesus, to help us persevere in life or death. And what an important sermon for us, too, don't you think? As we look ahead to persecution sooner or later, this chapter prepares us for whatever we'll face. So the preacher gives us here three pastoral encouragements to help us stay loyal to Jesus. Three pastoral encouragements to help us stay loyal to Jesus, to help us persevere. And this is like a lot like the conclusion to so many sermons. Normally, our preachers will conclude, right, with some pastoral exhortation. Pastoral exhortation, and the preacher covers that in verses 1 through 19. And then our preachers will finish with pastoral prayer. Pastoral prayer, like the preacher does here in verses 20 and 21. And finally, what comes after the closing prayer? Pastoral announcements. Pastoral announcements. And that's like what we see the, the author of Hebrews write in verses 22 through 25. But even the announcements here are meant to help us stay loyal to Jesus, to help us persevere. So before we get into the details of Hebrews 13, a wise preacher wanted us to make a little observation because most of Hebrews, right, has been about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. That's how Dr. Chow outlines it. But here in Hebrews 13, all of a sudden, we find a lot of stuff for us to do. But there's no way the author of Hebrews could write 12 full chapters about Jesus just to come to the end and say, now you can make yourself holy. No, this is not all of a sudden a bunch of work, good works, okay, to get us credit with God. In fact, back in Hebrews 12, 28, it's worth, worth looking at it, Hebrews 12, 28, the preacher just said to the believers in the audience, to those of us who have repented of our sin and have asked God to treat us as if we lived the perfect life of Jesus, that's the definition of a true Christian, The preacher says to us, if we're true Christians, Hebrews 12, 28, that we are receiving a kingdom. We are receiving a kingdom. He doesn't say we are earning a kingdom. He says we are receiving Jesus' kingdom. So when we get to Hebrews 13, doing all that we read about here is not the way to get into the kingdom. No, doing all of this is the way we live because we're part of of Jesus' kingdom, because we're receiving Jesus' kingdom. Doing all of this is our proper response to everything we've learned about in Hebrews this year. So with that cleared up, we can get into our text. 
And here the preacher wraps up his sermon, like we said, by giving us lots and lots of pastoral exhortation. Pastoral exhortation in verses 1 through 19 to help us stay loyal to Jesus, to help us persevere. And in this point, we're going to find 11, I know it's hard to believe, 11 actions of kingdom citizens. 11 actions of kingdom citizens. Because you can pretty much tell what country someone's from by their actions, by how they live, by what they do. And if we are receiving a heavenly kingdom, then we should be acting like heavenly citizens. And I love it because this is so pastoral. Along with each of his exhortations, the preacher also gives us a reason. He gives us a why. He gives us a motivation for our actions, a motivation for each of our proper responses to Jesus. So first of all, the preacher exhorts us that kingdom citizens love. Kingdom citizens love, in verse 1, let love, let Philadelphia love, let family love of the brothers continue. And as our pastor points out, this refers not just to their Jewish relatives, but to Christians. And why? What's our motivation to love? Kingdom citizens love because we're family. Kingdom citizens love because we're family. And this has become, in these months that I've been studying, this has become like my Sunday morning life verse, okay? No matter what happens with other Christians on Sunday morning or Sunday evening or Wednesday or whenever, we can say to ourselves again, okay, let love of the brothers continue, <laughs> right? And isn't it amazing to us the citizens of Jesus' kingdom are not just nationals. We're not just neighbors. We're not even just relatives, but we're brothers. We're siblings. In the Spanish ministry, we call each other hermanos, right? And by the way, if we're married to a Christian, then he's also our brother. So we must let love of our brother continue with him as well. So first, kingdom citizens love and secondly, kingdom citizens share. Kingdom citizens share in verse 2, because how can you love if you don't share? He says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, which means to love strangers, both inside and outside the church. And hospitality is not just about having people all over all the time. There are lots of non-Christians who are very good at that. No, hospitality is love for strangers. So when we're hospitable, we can share our home, we can share our time, we can share our resources with strangers. And as women, if God allows us to be pregnant, for whatever reason, the most basic act of hospitality is to love, to share, to give of our time and our resources and our whole life right? To that little stranger. Because really they come out and you're like, man, where did that come from? <laughs> that little baby, that little baby that we don't even know yet, right? And why? The preacher motiva motivates us by saying, for, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. But this isn't a promise that a stranger we share with might be an angel. The preacher of Hebrews likes to use the Old Testament, have we noticed, for illustrations. And this was something unique that happened only on a few crucial occasions in the Old Testament. So our motivation to be hospitable, to love strangers, to share our resources with strangers is not because we might host an angel, but because, as our pastor wisely says, we never know what might happen as a result of our hospitality. And this reminded me of how God saved my mother. When she was a teenager after school, before her parents would get home from work, she would go knock on the doors of her neighbors asking for food. And a Christian family would give her dinner. And eventually, God saved my mom in part because of their hospitality. So we never know what might happen as a result of our hospitality, the potential of hospitality. There's our motivation. The potential of hospitality should motivate us to share. 
So next, kingdom citizens care. Hebrews 13, 3, remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated. Why? What's the motivation? Since you yourselves also are in the body. So the preacher exhorts us that we should care. We should care because of the reality of suffering. We should care because of the reality of suffering. We're all also in the body. We all live in real human bodies. And as our pastor wisely said in his commentary, difficulties and pain and mistreatment are not some kind of illusion. And if we're loyal to Christ, like the Hebrew Christians, the suffering could get worse. Potentially, any of us could become prisoners or be mistreated. In fact, remember Hebrews 11.25, Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of God because he was loyal to God, because he persevered. So ladies, pain and suffering is real. At any moment, any of us can face some difficulty. And because we recognize the reality of suffering, because we ourselves are also in the body, kingdom citizens, true Christians should care. We should care about those who suffer. And now verse four, kingdom citizens honor. Kingdom citizens honor. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. And why? What's the motivation? For the sexually immoral and adulterers, God will judge. In other words, we must honor true marriage, which is only between one biological male and one biological female. And throughout scripture, we see consequences for dishonoring marriage. And Revelation 21.8, Revelation 21.8 tells us that God will judge us eternally if we don't repent of our sexual sin. So honor marriage because God will judge. That's the motivation. Honor marriage because God will judge. And here we see that kingdom citizens honor marriage. You see it? Both in its status, we hold it in honor. And kingdom citizens honor marriage by keeping it undefiled, by keeping it pure. So status and purity. Status and purity. It's not just about being sexually pure. Whether we're married or single, do we honor marriage in how we speak about marriage? In how we speak about husbands and wives? Do we honor marriage by how we encourage younger women to think about marriage? Do we give marriage the high position, the honorable status that God designed for marriage? And you know, ladies, just like I could spot an American in a crowd when we lived in Mexico City, well, nowadays you can spot a Christian by how they honor marriage, can't you? This exhortation, this verse, is a litmus test of whether we are truly loyal to Jesus in our time. It's right here in this verse where we're going to see who is truly a kingdom citizen or not. So kingdom citizens love, share, care, honor, and fifth, kingdom citizens trust. Kingdom citizens trust in verses 5 and 6 because our trust in God leads to our contentment. When we trust God, we stop putting our trust in money. Make sure that your way of life is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. And this is in the present tense, being content right now with what we have, not what we had in the past or what we might have in the future. For or why, what's our motivation for contentment? Because we can trust in God. The preacher reminds us, he himself has said, I will never desert you nor will I ever forsake you. And then he keeps going. And this must have been important because staying loyal to Jesus would cost so much for the Hebrew Christians. Some of them had already lost their possessions, right? According to Hebrews 10, 32. So in his pastoral, compassionate way, the preacher gives them even more encouragement in verse six. And what a blessing for us too, right after the exhortation to honor marriage, because if we are loyal to Jesus by honoring marriage, in our current culture, then we might lose our financial security. If we're married, our husband might lose his job. We might lose economic advancement or career opportunities. This is already starting to happen, right? But the dear preacher reminds us that because of what God has said in his word in Psalm 118, we, verse 6, can confidently say, notice, not just whisper, whisper, 
not even just say, but confidently say the Lord, Yahweh, the covenant-keeping, self-existing God, is my helper. So obviously I will not be afraid. Mm -hmm. What will man do to me? So we will only be content when we know and we trust in who God is. So we trust because God is trustworthy. We trust because God is trustworthy. And then number six, kingdom citizens imitate. Verses seven and eight, remember your leaders, which is literally leaders or guides, guides in the Greek, not pastors like some translations have it. Remember your leaders who spoke in the past tense. He's not referring to current leaders, but past leaders who spoke the word of God to you. And this is what a spiritual leader does. Would you agree? A spiritual leader is someone who spoke the word of God to us. And we can all speak the word of God with other women and children in our lives. A mom can do this with her children or a friend at work or a sister or an aunt or a grandmother or a woman who disciples us. And what's more, the preacher says, a true spiritual leader doesn't just speak God's word, but true spiritual leaders also obey God's word, right? Because next, the preacher says, and considering the result of their conduct, their conduct, considering the good result of their living, considering the good result of their obedience to scripture, here's the exhortation, imitate their faith. And here we are reminded that faith fleshes itself out in conduct. Like our pastor says, faith works. So we should consider and imitate. We should think and do. And this reminded me of our beloved pastor's wife, Patricia MacArthur. She has been a true leader. Guys, I don't know what. I did not sleep enough last night. Okay. She has been a true leader, a true guide in the sense of what we see here. Not in a sermon, not in a Bible study, but in her life and in her conversations by speaking and living scripture, hasn't she? And if you haven't heard the Q&A recordings of her on the website, I really would encourage you to do that. So that alone could be our motivation. Imitate because of the result of godliness. But the preacher goes beyond our human leaders to our ultimate leader. And in verse 8, he gives us an even higher motivation to imitate. The preacher exhorts us to imitate, not only because of the result of godly living, but because, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. True biblical leaders imitate our ultimate leader, our unchanging, ever-living, eternal Savior. So even when the Hebrew Christians lost their leaders to persecution, and even when our beloved pastors and their beloved wives are taken to glory, our beloved Savior will motivate us still to imitate him as they imitated him. And by the way, this verse is another of so many that show us that Jesus isn't just better because he's a great guy, but that Jesus is better because Jesus is God. Jesus is better because Jesus is God. Only God himself can be the same yesterday and today and forever. Only God himself is unchanging, immutable, eternal. So we imitate leaders because of the result of their obedience, and we imitate leaders because they imitated Christ. And now in seventh place, kingdom citizens stay firm. Kingdom citizens stay firm. Verses 9 and 10, the preacher exhorts us, do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings. And after everything we've learned about Jesus in Hebrews, the preacher wants the Hebrews, he wants us to stay firm in the truth that we've learned, to not be carried away by false teaching. And the preacher motivates us to stay firm with the why, with the reason in the rest of verse 9. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. And now there's something to write on our fridge. Those who were occupied with foods were not benefited. <laughs> but really, God never wanted his people to be occupied by the rituals 
of the old covenant, which involved foods. Mm -hmm. But by grace, by his undeserved favor. So believing that we can save ourselves or make ourselves more holy or get points with God by performing the rituals and activities of the Old Testament was, like our pastor Josiah said, varied and strange teachings. It was man-made ideas added to the law, which never taught that you could be saved by keeping it. That idea was added to corrupt God's word. Salvation has always been by grace. Before Christ, by believing in the Messiah who was to come, and after Christ, by believing in the Messiah who has come. And in verse 10, the preacher motivates the Hebrews to stay firm in grace by reminding them of the superiority of Jesus' sacrifice. This is the reason. This is the motivation to stay firm. The, pastor, the preacher says in verse 10, we have an altar, or as wise pastors have said, we have the sacrifice of Jesus in our place. We have the sacrifice of Jesus in our place from which those who serve the tabernacle have no authority to eat. And like Dr. S. Lewis Johnson explained, as long as someone serves the tabernacle, as long as someone continues in any system without trusting in Jesus only, then they have no authority to benefit from Jesus' sacrifice in their place. Only when we leave all other systems and ideas and philosophies and religions and trust only in Jesus for our righteousness, then... And only then can we be forgiven of our sins. So we must stay firm in grace because only God's grace benefits us. We must stay firm in grace because only God's grace benefits us. Only God's grace, only God's undeserved favor saves us. So kingdom citizens love, share, care, honor, trust, imitate, stay firm. And eighth, kingdom citizens separate. Kingdom citizens separate in verses 11 through 14. And like Pastor Josiah says, this is the logical conclusion to which all those other exhortation passages in Hebrews have been leading. Verse 11, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Verse 12, therefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people through his own blood suffered outside the gate. And here the preacher focus on, focuses us on location, location, location. Outside, verse 11, outside, verse 12, outside, verse 13, and here in verse 14. So just like the sacrifices that were burned outside the camp on the Day of Atonement, Jesus died outside of Jerusalem, to sanctify or to purify or to free from guilt all those who repent and believe. So verse 13, the preacher says, because of what Jesus did, what should be our response? The preacher exhorts us, let us go out to him outside the camp. In other words, let us separate, which could take a while to explain, okay? But we can summarize it by saying that we must separate ourselves from all false human ideas. And then he says, bearing his reproach, being willing to suffer, being willing to go even to our death, just like Jesus did. And apparently, the preacher knows that we're going to need some courage to go out to Jesus, that we're going to need courage to separate because he's so pastoral and he gives us what, for me, is the most helpful motivation of all of his motivations. In verse 14, the preacher says we should go out to Jesus. We should separate because, after all, verse 14, here we do not have a lasting city. That has been a strong phrase for me. Here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the one, the city, to come and there is so much that could be said about our heavenly citizenship. Hebrews 3, Hebrews 8, like all of Hebrews 11, Hebrews 12, 1 Corinthians 15, 2 Corinthians 5, Philippians 3.20, Colossians 3, all over the place. But Spurgeon, you know we love Spurgeon, 
Spurgeon said about this verse, do not build your nest on any one of the trees of earth, for they are all marked for the ax, and they will all have to come down, and your nest too, if you have built upon them. So we separate ourselves, we go outside of false religion, of false human ideas and philosophies, and all of our temporal human securities to follow Jesus, even if we die for it. Because why? What's our motivation? Our hope is in Jesus and his city, not the cities here, and his unshakable kingdom. Our hope is not in this world. We separate because of our future hope. We separate because of our future hope. And then in ninth place, kingdom citizens offer. Kingdom citizens offer, verses 15 and 16. If we have chosen to separate ourselves from the world because of Jesus' perfect sacrifice in our place, then we can finally offer sacrifices as well. Not sacrifices that save, but sacrifices that are the result of salvation. Verse 15 Through him then, not through us, not through the sacrificial system, not through Moses, not through angels, but through Jesus. Because Jesus is better, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God like we see in Psalm 49, Psalm 50, Psalm 116. That is the fruit of or the result of lips that confess his name. Verse 16, and do not neglect doing good and sharing. Why? What's our motivation? For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. So kingdom citizens offer because it pleases God. Kingdom citizens offer because it pleases God. And isn't this just the perfect verse for all of us as women? Whether single or wives or mothers or widows, God is pleased with the sacrifices we make when we are doing good and sharing. And how practical, how encouraging for everyday life to please the true God. We don't need to be really smart Bible theologians or incredible missionaries or famous evangelists. He is pleased with doing good and sharing. And by the way, It is God who determines what is good. And he gives us specific commands as daughters, as single women, as wives, as mothers, and even as widows. So like our pastor pointed out, just like God didn't accept strange fire from Nadab and Abihu because it didn't conform to his command, well, God is only pleased with our sacrifices. They're only good when they're given in conformity with his word in conformity to his design and his commands for us. So a lot of the stuff that the world and even well-meaning Christians think are good for Christian women to do are actually not the good that God has commanded us to do. And before we go on, we have to notice that the preacher doesn't say that our offerings satisfy God. He doesn't say our offerings satisfy God because only Jesus' sacrifice satisfied God's holy wrath. But that our offerings of praise and doing good please God. They don't get us, you know, points with God. They're just pleasing to him. And just like our children don't become our children when they obey us, they just please us when they obey us. In the same way, we can't make ourselves any more related to God by doing what he says. He's just pleased with us. He's happy with us when we do what he says. There's a relationship that we have with him. So we offer because it pleases God. We offer because it pleases God. And then number 10, kingdom citizens line up. Kingdom citizens line up. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit. There's our favorite word in the Bible. Submit to them. In other words, line up. But why? For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they will do this with joy and not with groaning. For this would be unprofitable for you. Hmm. And the preacher doesn't say why 
but maybe the Hebrews and maybe we could all use some extra help to line up. Because here he gives us two exhortations, right? Not one this time, but two, obey and submit. In other words, line up. And then he gives us like three motivations to get us to line up. Line up because God requires our leaders to care for us spiritually. Line up because rebellion causes groaning. And line up because rebellion is unprofitable. Three. And Pastor Josiah explained that it is unprofitable to disobey godly leaders because truly godly leaders lead us to what is good. They're not perfect in their leadership, but like Peter says, godly leaders don't lord it over the sheep. So, unless we are asked to sin, it's not only obey or do what you're told. That's a definition for obedience. Do what you're told, but also submit or line up under the direction of your authority. Line up under the direction of your authority. So, we line up because it's good for everybody. We line up because it's good for everybody. It's good for our leaders, and it's good for us. And this reminds me of how we take the toddlers for a walk when we serve in nursery. Have you seen them all there, you know, holding on to the little rings on the cord? They're so cute. And we make them all line up, like we see here in Hebrews 13, 17, Why? So we can watch over them, so we can care for them, so we don't groan while trying to lead them. You know, it would really make us groan if we tried to take a bunch of toddlers outside and let them go everywhere. And we also make them line up because it's unprofitable for our toddlers to get out of line because they can hurt themselves or hurt the other toddlers. So in the same way, we line up because it allows us to be cared for It prevents groaning in our leaders, and it's profitable. It's good for us. It keeps us out of trouble. And finally, we come to the last exhortation of this chapter before the final prayer and the announcements in response to who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Kingdom citizens, love, share, care, honor, trust, imitate, stay firm, separate, offer, align up. And in 11th place, I run out of fingers, Kingdom citizens pray. Kingdom citizens pray. Verses 18 through 19, pray for us. He likes to talk in plural. Because why? What's the motivation? Pray for us. For we are convinced that we have a good good conscience desiring to conduct ourselves well in all things. And when a pastor or a missionary is faithful, when he wants to conduct himself well in all things, then that motivates us to pray for them, doesn't it? And then the preacher gives us another motivation to pray. Verse 19, and I urge you all the more to do this so that, why? So that I may be restored to you the sooner. We should pray because God answers prayer according to his will. So pray because faithful pastors and missionaries need our prayer and pray because God answers prayer according to his will. We should pray. <clears throat> okay, I said that. I was about to repeat it. Okay. And isn't that a beautiful prayer request? The author of Hebrews longs for fellowship with other Christians. And isn't that something that we have all prayed for the last few years? For fellowship in person with other Christians? And I think it's so comforting that the list of 11 actions of kingdom citizens finishes with the way kingdom citizens speak to their king. Isn't that comforting? And have we thought about this? In what kingdom in the world can you just talk whenever you want with the king? Well, only in Jesus' kingdom. He's so much better. And that's another reason to stay loyal to Jesus. So that was the first point in our outline. The first point in the conclusion to the preacher's sermon to the Hebrews. Don't worry, the next two points are shorter. And after this huge list of our proper responses to Jesus, I don't know about you all, but I feel a little overwhelmed. Which is why we need verses 20 and 21. After so much pastoral exhortation, we need a little pastoral prayer pastoral prayer in verses 20 and 21 to help us stay loyal to Jesus. 
to help us persevere. And after just asking them to pray for him, like a good pastor, the preacher prays for them. And we can't, because we can't do all of this without God's help, can we? And starting in verse 20, he prays, Now, the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, our Lord Jesus. And we have to just pause. Because this is like an incredible piling up of truths about God. He is our peacemaking God who is omnipotent and Jesus is our caring shepherd, our selfless sacrifice, our faithful covenant keeper and Lord of the universe. Six enormous truths about God in one verse. Trust me, a good expositor could get, could get a whole sermon here. But why did the preacher choose these specific truths about God? Well, he doesn't say, but these sure are truths about God that would have helped The Hebrew Christians stay loyal to Jesus. And then the title, the eternal covenant, remember, refers to the new covenant, which like Pastor Riccardi taught us, um, is God's promise of regeneration, forgiveness, the Holy Spirit, and Israel's restoration. And the eternal covenant is eternal, like our pastor says, because it can't be broken by our sin. And then in verse 21, the preacher asks God to equip you in every good thing to do his will. The preacher is asking God to give the Hebrews the power to do everything we've seen in the last 19 verses. But how? By doing in us, the preacher includes himself again. Again, talking in plural, us, he's a humble man. He asks God to do in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And maybe that's why our pastor uses this prayer so often after he preaches. Have you noticed? It's the kind of prayer we need after a strong sermon. And just to make it extra super duper clear, the preacher reminds us, that we can only do what we see here in Hebrews 13. We can only do what pleases God through the power of Jesus in us. From the equipping to the, to the doing of his will to the internal desire, the doing in us. You see it there? It's all his power, not ours. And this is a prayer we can all pray, that God would go where we cannot go. We could go as a missionary to a country halfway around the world, but we can never go inside of anyone, can we? Only God can reach inside of our child or our friend or our coworker or family members or grandchildren. Only God can equip them to do what is pleasing in his sight. So that means as we look back at all of Hebrews, That Jesus is not only better than the sacrificial system. Jesus is not only better than angels. Jesus is not only better than Moses, but hold on to your horses. Jesus is better even than us. Jesus is better than us. And I say it that way because nowadays most people, honestly, don't care very much about how incredible Moses is or Joshua, or the angels, or the sacrificial system was. Would you agree? For the most part in our culture, we adore, we worship, we highly respect, not Moses, not angels, not the Levitical priesthood. We worship ourselves, don't we? We worship ourselves. And we are told from the youngest age that we can do anything we put our mind to, especially if you're a girl. That essentially we are God, right? But even though this chapter talks so much about what we have to do, in this prayer, we learn that if we do anything that pleases God, anything, it's only because God himself gave us the power to please him. Just like we've seen all through Hebrews, it is Jesus who deserves our loyalty, our perseverance, because it is his 
very power in us that makes us loyal, that makes us persevere. Dr. S. Lewis Johnson said about this verse, it is God who moves the will of man to do the will of God. It is God who moves the will of man to do the will of God. So, verses 20 through 21 were this incredible prayer at the end of this incredible sermon, all of Hebrews, and now we see what happens after the sermon finishes. Here the author gives us pastoral announcements. Pastoral announcements in verses 22 through 25 to help us stay loyal to Jesus, to help us persevere. And the first announcement is that this was a short sermon, okay? The first announcement is that this was a short sermon, verse 22, to receive with humility, a short sermon to receive with humility. The author says, but I urge you, brothers, bear with this word of exhortation, which kind of sounds like we should put up with the book of Hebrews, right? But in reality, the study Bible says it means to receive this message with an open mind and a warm heart. And that's exactly what a Christian does when we walk in the Spirit. Listening to a word of exhortation, listening to a sermon is a privilege, isn't it? It's a privilege. And the phrase, this word of exhortation, confirms this was probably a sermon written down and sent as a letter to the churches. And actually, this kind of helps us understand what to expect in a sermon, okay? A sermon is a word of exhortation, like we see in Acts 13. And since a sermon is a word of exhortation, then maybe we should expect to be exhorted. Hmm? Like our pastor often says, Soft sermons make for hard hearts, and hard sermons make for soft hearts. And another point, since we're all women here, even though the author uses a masculine pronoun to refer to himself in Hebrews 11.32, Hebrews 11.32, some people suggest that the author may have been a woman because he doesn't identify himself, and then he says, I have written to you briefly. And Hebrews seems kind of long. But please, please, we all know men who can give long sermons, okay? And besides, the author couldn't have been a woman because even though women can teach other women and children, women are not to take authority over men in the church and women are not to preach. So, for what it's worth, the early church thought that the author of Hebrews was Luke, who wrote down a sermon by Paul. And even in the two verses, which don't sound like something Paul would say about himself in Hebrews 2.3 and Hebrews 13.23, Dr. Chow points out that like so many preachers, Paul may have been speaking in plural, like we've seen happen even in this chapter over and over. So it's still a bit of a mystery. We're not 100% sure of who he was, but like Dr. S. Lewis Johnson said, for sure, the author of Hebrews was a man, Okay. And his first announcement was, receive this short sermon with humility. And then in his second announcement, he gives us a short testimony. A short testimony in verse 23. So a short sermon, a short testimony. And the announcements just keep getting better because the author gives an announcement, I love it, about a timid, fearful Christian who was strengthened by God to persevere. The perfect example for the Hebrews and for us. The author tells them, Know that our brother Timothy, not my son Timothy, but our brother, so this could be Paul talking in plural, or perhaps not Paul talking, but maybe, maybe Luke writing, whoever it is, okay, he wants the Hebrews to know that Timothy has been released, with whom if he comes, I will see you. If he comes soon, I will see you. He's so affectionate, isn't he? But what I really love about this short testimony is how it shows that timid Timothy was strengthened by God to be loyal to Christ, to persevere because apparently Timothy suffered persecution. So after all of Hebrews, I think this is just the perfect announcement of a testimony that God can help us stay loyal to Jesus. God can help us persevere even if we are weak. So a short sermon, a short testimony, and the last announcement is a short greeting. A short greeting, verse 24. 
Greet all of your leaders and all the saints, those from Italy greet you, which makes some commentators think Hebrews may have been written to the church in Rome or came from Rome. But what stands out in this verse is the affection in these greetings. Do we see it? And haven't we all just met a Christian from somewhere else and we find ourselves loving them right away? Well, this announcement reminds us that because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, because Jesus is better, he gives us true love, true affection for other Christians, no matter who they are, leaders or other saints, and no matter where they're from, Italy or Rome or California or Mexico or wherever. So a short sermon, a short testimony, and a short greeting. And finally, the book finishes with, what was the whole point. In conclusion, in verse 25, the author says, grace, or God's undeserved favor, be with you all. And we should notice that he does not say law, be with you all. He doesn't say law, be with you all, but grace, be with you all. And once more, it is God's grace. It is God's undeserved favor. It is God's loyalty to us that keeps us loyal to Christ. So even though we can't see him or feel him, as we simply obey him and repent when we sin, God empowers us to persevere, to stay loyal to Jesus. And those last two little words, you all, you all, they remind us that we're not alone as we strive to stay loyal to Jesus, as we strive to persevere in every stage, in every circumstance, in every trial, just like the Hebrew Christians, we are fighting to stay loyal, to persevere along with, along with our fellow sisters, along with our hermanas. So it's not just, he will hold me fast, but he will hold us fast. It's not just he will hold me fast. He will hold us fast. So it's been our prayer that these three pastoral encouragements from Hebrews 13, the exhortation, the prayer, and even the announcements will help us to stay loyal to Jesus, will help us persevere in life or in death because Jesus is not only better, but because Jesus is better, Jesus is worthy of our living and our dying. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your word, which always comes to us perfectly just when we need it. And we thank you for all the women who are here this morning. And we would ask that if there's any woman here who doesn't know you, that you would mercifully open her heart to receive this word of exhortation, all the book of Hebrews, to repent and to put her trust in Jesus for her salvation. And we ask, Lord, that if we are your daughters, that you would help us stay loyal to Jesus, that you would help us to persevere by your grace. Amen.